I invite you all to arrive into the space with us today. I welcome you. My name is Liana Sananda Galuli. I have the great honor of hosting the speaker series today at Entheo Generation. How many of you have attended any other of the talks that we've hosted this week? All right, awesome. So I will start, we have about one more minute until our speaker is ready. I'll tell you just a little bit about myself. I help run development for the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, also known as MAPS. And MAPS, yeah, give it up for MAPS. MAPS is uh, out here at Burning Man hosting this speaker series, hosting the Zendo Project, helping provide peer support to people having difficult or challenging experiences with psychedelics. So we are so excited to be here and to see all of you here today. And it is a great privilege and honor to invite up to the stage Dr. Natalie Metz, who is a, yeah, Natalie is a naturopathic doctor. And she is also a professor of psychedelic studies, um, psychedelic medicine at the California Institute of Integral Studies. And Natalie has also worked with the Mazotex, who are the modern holders of ancient mushroom ceremonies down in Mexico. And Natalie will be speaking to us today about intention and integration and all the important things to consider when utilizing these sacred tools. So please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Natalie Metz. Good afternoon. How's it going out there? Yay! All right, give me just a second here to pull it together. It's a relative pulling it together at Burning Man, right? <laughs> Whatever together is, I'm doing great. I have some gifts in this bag, so it's really important that I get them out for you. All right, Whew. how's that, better? Okay, how are you feeling out there? Yeah? How's your burn going? Awesome, I wanna take a quick survey. How many people are here for the first time? Yes. How many people have been here five times or more? Keep your hand up, it's 10 times or more. 15 times or more, 20 times or more. Ah, Annie, killing it over here. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> this is my 18th burn. I might be becoming an adult on the playa this year, but there's no guarantee. I'm not sure. All right, so I'd like to thank you all for making the trek and for doing whatever it took to get here. I know I just hauled ass across the playa in like gale force winds and dust to be here. And I'm really honored and blessed. I want to say thank you to MAPS, thank you to Liana, thank you to Bronner's and Fomogenesis and foaming against all the machines and all the things that we do over here. It's really a wonderful opportunity to be with you today. As Liana said, I am a naturopathic doctor. I have a private medical practice in Oakland, California. I also teach at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco in a program called the Integrative Health Studies Department and also in the Center for Psychedelic Therapies and Research. I also do a lot of work to support people who are integrating psychedelic experiences or what I call really beyond ordinary life experiences. So sometimes we experience a trauma, the birth or death of a loved one. We go to Burning Man and these are beyond ordinary life experiences and sometimes we need help to integrate that into our lives. So that's a a specialty within my practice, along with what I call compassionate gynecology. If any of you have ever had a gynecological appointment, it might not be the most fun part of your day, right? So I really try to work with my patients to empower and create a very safe space for as best a gynecological exam as can possibly happen. So that's a little bit about what I'm up to in the default world. This year, I'm camping with delicious, wonderful friends at Soft Landing. We have a fantastic tea house at 8.30 and E, as well as a visionary speaker series at Palenque Norte. I first came to Burning Man in 2002. A couple of my friends from medical school said, we're gonna go to Burning Man. And I thought, is Burning Man like a band or a group? 
And then I looked it up and I thought, oh my God, I got to go to this. And I've been hooked ever since. And to be very honest, when I got here very late Tuesday night, Wednesday I'm setting up camp and I'm thinking, what am I doing here? This is so hard. This is so much work. And then what happened? I got to come to a private party here in the foam dome, get a double foam, a sashimi dinner, grilled tuna, eggplant sandwiches, and get on a Braxis and ride around on the playa looking at art. I thought, I'm doing something right. <laughs> Everything's okay, right? <laughs> All right. So, I entitled this talk this year, Psychedelic Sacred Technology of the Past, Present, and Future. And I'd like to take a few moments to just think through some terminology and take a look at what some of these words mean. Psychedelic, sacred, technology, what does it actually mean? Let's hope this clicker works from afar. Ooh. Maybe? Ooh. So what is sacred? Sacred is something worthy of awe and respect, something that compels us into contact with something inside ourselves that moves and shakes us and wiggles us up a little bit, right? And why do I pair that with technology? Because if we are working with these tools that can help us to come into contact with awe and respect, we can potentially work with these tools in a more conscious way. It's not a guarantee, but it's an option. So what is technology? A little slow to move. We'll get there. This is a beautiful sacred place on the planet. I'm very blessed to say that in a few weeks I'm going to be going down the Grand Canyon for two weeks in a raft. Woo! That's going to be amazing and life-changing. If I don't come in contact with the sacred there, I don't know what's going on, right? So what is technology? Technology is a word that originates from two Greek words put together, techni and logia, the study of an art or a craft. It can be described also as the applied knowledge that manifests in material and non-material forms. It is a multivalent word, meaning that it is composed of the actors, the processes, the constructs, and the use of these constructs. So the people, the beings, the organisms who make the things, the processes by which they do them, the actual things that are made in them, what we do with them, right? They can also be thought of as tools for navigation, right? Navigating the human experience. It's quite a journey, yeah? The ups, the downs, the sideways, the in-between, all of that. We all need, at least in my opinion, as much help as we can get to navigate walking around in this earth body, okay? They can also help us to transform. We come into contact with material that might be really pleasant, we might really like it. We also come into contact with material that's really difficult. Maybe we don't like that so much. And they help us to metabolize. When we have tools for metabolizing, we can actually self-actualize, transform, and evolve. Come on. Come on, technology, work with me. <laughs> I'd like to throw out a few definitions by some other scholars out there. Technology, the organization of knowledge for the achievement of practical purposes. Well, I guess it depends what you think practical is, right? The application of organized knowledge to practical tasks by ordered systems of people and machines. I'd like you to just notice that it's a little bit of an anthropocentric view here. <laughs> the knowledge and instruments that humans use to accomplish the purposes of life. Again, these definitions are a little bit focused on human and machine. And so I've taken the liberty of quoting a friend of mine, soon to be Dr. Theo Badashi, a cosmohumanist, in his definition of technology. That psychic, it's psychic and material constructs created by organisms for the benefit of their survival, actualization, and evolution, and all the cultural, ecological, and cosmological forces and processes involved in such creations. This is from his manifesto called Technosophia. Beautiful, huh? So what about this word psychedelic? What does this mean? Some people interpret it to mean mind manifesting. Some people interpret it to mean soul manifesting. It originated out of a dialogue between Ellis Huxley and Humphrey Osmond. Aldous Huxley, Doors of Perception, a psychonaut who had the good fortune of coming in contact with mescaline early on. Humphrey Osmond, a psychiatrist in practice in Canada. And they were writing letters back and forth to try to describe the experience evoked by mescaline and eventually by our other allies such as LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, DMT, ketamine, dot, dot, dot. So in this letter, Huxley wrote to Osmond, to make this mundane world sublime, take half a gram fan arrow time. 
And Osmond responded to Huxley saying, to fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. <laughs> I'd like to also introduce a couple other terms because as humans, we spend a lot of time trying to create language, right? We spend a lot of time trying to give words or give to um, externalize our internal experience in a symbolic or perhaps literal way so that we can encode it and transmit it throughout time. That's perhaps one of the unique things that humans do is we externalize and record knowledge in certain ways. It might not be exclusive to us, but it is something that we do. So Karl Ruck, also a scholar, coined this word entheogen, which he says means contacting or generating the divinity within. So coming into contact with God, goddess, the universe, the oneness, all that is, the being, the nothingness, the void, contacting that within. Richard Doyle expands this a little bit to be more inclusive with his term ecodelic. Ecodelic, I'll just pull out kind of what I think is most important. These are substances that we can work with that help to catalyze a state in which we eventually perceive ourselves as a part of a complex web of relationships that includes not only every one of us, but the entire cosmos as well. So again, wait for that to go by. Stepping out of this anthropocentric worldview and encompassing the whole entire cosmos. It's an important part of what we're up to here in the context of thinking of these tools as sacred technology. Michael Winkelmann, another scholar, expands us a bit further and calls these substances psychointegrators. He says that they help us to turn towards an integrative, holistic growth process. And that they're very effective at helping us to establish direct contact with the supernatural, for assistance with healing, often accompanied with belief in animism, animistic properties of other beings on the planet or beyond. Relationships with animals as a source of power. They can help to catalyze the death of the ego, can support us in processes of divination, and function in the promotion of social solidarity. I'd like to just emphasize that for a moment. Social solidarity, something we really need right now, yeah? Take a look at what's happening on the planet right now, right? It's pretty intense out there. We happen to be some of the lucky ones that got ourselves out here to the playa, right? What is there, maybe 80,000 of us this year? I'm not sure. When I first started coming to Burning Man, it was 35,000 people. The city has more than doubled. With that, with growth comes opportunity, with growth also comes responsibility. And so if we want to be stewards of this wisdom tradition, this sacred technology, this culture, we have to find ways to stand in social solidarity with one another, emotional solidarity, spiritual solidarity. This isn't the time for us versus them. It is time to unify. And not only with our human brothers and sisters and everybody that's on the non-binary spectrum, but with all of the entire cosmos. And I'll say more about that later. <clears throat> there is a frequency that exists within you. It's called God. <laughs> and you can tune in at any point in time. <laughs> and Burning Man's a great place to do that, right? How many of you have had an experience of something divine this week? Yeah, right? Something inside yourself. So some impor important things to remember about psychedelics is that they are not inherently toxic, right? We need, to we need to dispel these myths about psychedelics being toxic. They're just really not. With the exception of perhaps ketamine in excess use, nitrous oxide in excess use, MDMA in excess use, perhaps a few others, they're generally not toxic and they're generally not habit forming. That's a pretty unique distinction between many of the other pharmacological agents that are out there. Many of them do cause an elevation in body temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, medriasis, that's the fancy word for this wide-eyed look. <laughs> Why do the eyes open up? Perhaps they're allowing us to see more, to take more in. Psychedelics can also cause a little bit of digestive system discomfort. It can mess with our awareness of the need for things like food, urination. So it's good to check in on your bodily processes, especially if you're into hour 15 on the playa, dancing at the Mayan warrior. Have you had a drink in a while? <laughs> Have you gone to the chamber of doom to leave whatever you need to leave behind? That's my name for the porta potties. <laughs> Psychedelics also catalyze neurochemical alteration, disruption, sometimes potentiation. 
We're learning more and more about how psychedelics interact with our neurochemistry and our bodily systems. They can also produce oxidative stress, which can affect the adrenal glands, the immune system, and countless other body systems. So it's important to tend to the physical body as well as the emotional, spiritual, and mental bodies. They can also lead to the disintegration of familiar frameworks, right? Oh, things looked like this through my lens today, and now they look a lot different. I don't even know where the lens went, right? That can be an intense process, right? Getting profound downloads in a psychedelic or otherwise beyond ordinary life experience can lead us to question, well, I mean, what happens next? <laughs> where do I go from here? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to like go back to work on Monday? I don't know about that. <laughs> Some things that could be helpful to keep in mind around the utilization of psychedelics. There's an adage from naturopathic medicine that says, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So bringing some mindfulness to these considerations can help us to prevent fallout, <laughs> okay? Anybody ever felt exhausted in their life? Had an emotional melt through, as I like to call it, rather than a meltdown? <laughs> Right? We, can, we can work to calibrate ourselves as an instrument to be more adapt and adept at preventing that or to come up to the edge of our comfort zone and to find ways to support ourselves to stay playing at the edge of life but also to do it with, with mindfulness, with care so that we survive and thrive on the other side. So it's a very important piece of psychedelic work is thinking about preparation, preparing oneself on all levels of being, body, mind, spirit, soul, and beyond, bringing attention to one's intention, right? And intention is something that we set as a way of guiding us through a space, right? So maybe you have an intention for Burning Man. If you don't, you can always create one. Maybe you have an intention for your day. My intention for Burning Man came to me in the shower the day before I left, and my intention for Burning Man this year is to fall in love with myself again. I don't know. <laughs> I lost some love along the way. <laughs> and, and what else do I have to give to myself besides love and self-care? So intention is a very important piece of it. It can serve as a guidepost to help us navigate through the terrain that we might encounter. We can bring questions to psychedelic experiences. We can think about what kind of themes we want to explore. It's also really important to think about one's mindset and the setting that we're gonna be in. What is it that we're bringing and what's the context that we'll be entering into? It's very important to also think about the substance and the dosage. There's wonderful resources like Arrowid, arrowid.org, right? Fantastic resource for learning many, many things about the complex interaction between humans and psychedelics. It's important to also think about the presence of a sitter or a guide, and I distinguish these. I think of a sitter as someone who's there to support us with consensus reality needs. So whether that's a tissue, a hand to the bathroom, a guide is someone who is skilled at navigating the terrain that we might encounter, right? So I'm about to go down the Grand Canyon. I'm sure as hell not gonna do that on my own. I'm going with an outfitter that's been down the canyon many times, knows where to anticipate those rapids and how to navigate that, right? That's the importance of having a guide. That can be a very therapeutic and supportive thing in psychedelic work. Sorry about that to help us navigate whatever terrain we might encounter, but we might not always anticipate, right? Important to think about our status of nutrition, detoxification, biochemical individuality. Each of our bodies, each of our systems metabolize things differently, right? Some of us can look at a piece of chocolate and put on five pounds. Some people can eat five pounds of chocolate and not put on a pound, right? So each of us metabolizes things differently on all levels of our being. Important to think about the physical condition and to optimize that coming in, and consider all other aspects of well-being. And last but not least, perhaps most importantly, the integration process. What do we do with the material that we've contacted in a beyond ordinary life experience on the other side? How do we weave those threads into our lives in a way that has meaning and benefit so that the information can be distilled into our lives and form new crystals of insight? and we can weave that into our individual beings and also into our community. It's a way of bringing the memos home in a way that has meaning and benefit for us ultimately. So take a moment to say a little bit about paradigms, right? A paradigm is a lens that we're looking at the world through. We can also think of it as a worldview. There's one worldview 
that's very interested in what's happening on the neurochemical level, right? So we know that most psychedelics interact with something called the 5-HT2A receptor. This is a serotonin receptor that's found throughout the brain, probably in other structures throughout the body, and it's essentially like a lock into which fit the keys of psychedelics as well as our endogenous neurotransmitter serotonin. So we can see here on the left hand of the slide a bunch of different molecules, those little red wedges. Those are LSD and DOM and psilocybin locking into receptors. On the right hand of the slide is a simplified version of MDMA and serotonin interlocking into the serotonin receptor. Another perspective on how we might be having these experience, a more phenomenological experience. Is there another mechanism of action? What I propose is that we might be coursing this trajectory. When we have a beyond ordinary life experience or a psychedelic experience, we often get humbled in some way, shape, or form. And when we get humbled, we get acutely in touch with our vulnerability. And when we're in touch with our vulnerability, we're able to come into more intimate relationship with ourselves. We're also able to come into more intimate relationship with others with other beings, with the cosmos at large. And when we are in those spaces of intimacy, I believe that what is naturally born and derived is a state of empathy. A state of empathy, a state of care for the other. S care such that I care about, I see myself in you, I see you in me, and therefore I care about extending love. I care about extending compassion to you. I, and this process, I believe, is is ultimately healing and recursive. It, it feeds back into the cycle. The more that we expand our capacity for love, for compassion, for forgiveness, for patience, the more that we're able to tap back into our humility, our vulnerability, intimacy, empathy, on and on. It's a spiral, perhaps. So I offer that as another frame for considering how these powerful substances might be interfacing with us. I'm going to pause for a quick second. And I'm going to start over here handing out some Playa gifts. So in these bags are some homemade lip balm. I've been making lip balm and handing it out here for about 10 years. It's a pretty fresh batch, made about a month ago. And then my new fantastic business card, my Burning Man business card. It's really important. So f please feel free to take a lip balm, a business card, say hello, write me a note, let me know how you're doing, how your burn went. I'd love to hear. Somehow we went way back in time. Let's see here. So back to neurochemistry. <laughs> or not. Vulnerability, intimacy, empathy. And we'll take a look to history for a moment. So this next image is a reproduction made by Kat Harrison. She was married to Terence McKenna for many years. This is a reproduction of an image called the Bee Shaman, or our term is the Bee Shaman, found in a cave painting in um, Algiers in Africa. And we can see that this shaman being has mushrooms growing out of its body and has the, the head of a bee. If you are able to stick around and hang out and hear Paul Stamets talk next, which I highly recommend, <laughs> he'll probably share a bit more about his work with bees and mycelium and helping to prevent colony collapse. So there is a unique relationship. And these are some of the mushroom stones that have been found throughout Mesoamerica. They're estimated to be who knows? I've heard as old as 3,000 years old. And why would someone spend the time to carve a stone into a mushroom form? Because it has meaning for them and they're trying to externalize that and formulate a symbol that can withstand the test of time. So these are some of the historical images that our ancestors have left behind, giving us a clue about what's actually important for them. This is a slide of the psychoactive species of the world. It's by no means all-inclusive, but we have within this image countless plants and animals that are known to interface with humans in a way that we describe as psychoactive. So we can see that there are species all across the globe 
with which all of our ancestors, wherever we all came from, had at some point in time the opportunity to interface with. And I believe that as we look to the past, it was probably psychoactive, psychedelic, entheogenic, ecodelic, psychointegrator materials that were helping us to evolve ourselves, helping our consciousness to evolve. David, love you. <laughs> Here's a few of our perhaps more well-known allies. Ayahuasca on the left, coming from the deep Amazon. Iboga, also referred to as grandfather, coming from West Africa. I was first told about Iboga when I was in medical school in a nutrition class, because obviously we're talking about psychedelics in nutrition class at medical school. But my teacher said, Iboga is like sitting down with seven generations of your ancestors. I don't know how that would go for you, but I think that they would have a few things to say to me. There might be like, hey, you did a good job there, and you, you kind of, mm -mm, not so much over there. It would be a reckoning point, I believe. Psilocybin mushrooms on the right-hand side, also affectionately referred to as the Niño Santos. I like to think about this concept of anthropobotanical migrations that plants and animals are actually employing each other, <laughs> and humans, of course, in the kingdom of Animalia, they're actually employing each other in their, in their survival strategies. Michael Pollan, who wrote, of course, a psychedelic book that has made waves in the culture, also wrote a book called The Botany of Desire many years ago. Hi, Paul. <laughs> and The Botany of Desire talks just about this. Maybe it's the plants that are actually using us to move around the planet and get their consciousness elsewhere, because the plants are a little bit more rooted in the ground than we are, right? We can get in planes, we can dance, we can move around, but the plants, they need sometimes a little help from other animals to move around the planet. So, plant, so people have moved around the whole planet, taking plants with them, and perhaps in search of plants. And plants have moved around the planet, using humans as vectors, as well as other animals. And the questions that I have, are plants moving around the planet in search of people? Is ayahuasca doing that? Are psychedelics perhaps doing the same? Are these medicines coming into mainstream global consciousness at this point in time because they want to presence themselves to us? Is that what's happening? Banisteriopsis capi, the ayahuasca vine, look at its structure spiraling up from the earth to the heavens. In the 1970s is my understanding, Kat Harrison and Terence McKenna brought ayahuasca out of the Amazon shipped it in a little box over to Hawaii and planted it on the big island. This is actually an, an, an image from the garden there where they planted ayahuasca. And ayahuasca, if we think about its consciousness, perhaps it wants to weave itself around the globe. So I'd like to think about these things. What are the plants doing? What do they want? What we see come forth from these amazing sacred technologies and wisdom traditions is, oh boy, is amazing art. We'll just try again. The image that I was going to show is one of the Shipibo people's art. It's in a process by which they stitch very fine um, impressions of what they call ikaros, which are songs, songs that are given to us from the plants. They're also representative of energetic matrices within our beings and within nature. Oh, we're down a cable over here. <laughs> I love this. See, sacred technology, it's working with us. It's all good, we're done. Yeah, it's Burning Man. So work with me. On the next slides, what I wanted to show was an image of the beautiful peyote cactus. The peyote cactus, also another form of sacred technology, used by people in Mexico and southwestern, quote unquote, US, the huicholes being some of the guardians of this sacred technology. The peyote cactus contains mescaline, also one of our most potent psychedelics in some ways. And they create beautiful artworks, beautiful pieces of sacred technology come out with yarn and with beads. They painstakingly coat objects with wax. 
and then they inlay little fine pieces of yarn or little tiny beads, these little tiny beads that are in my earrings. If you can imagine painstakingly pressing them into patterns, why so much time and attention to externalizing this material into symbolic form? Because it has meaning, because it is important, right? Oh, we're, we're, we're close, we're close. So here's our Shipibo impression of an Ikaro. Again, the energetic matrix that's sometimes seen. Oh, but we need it bigger. <laughs> Say it again. It just, I don't know. Well, we can work with it, right? We're flowing. <laughs> Yeah, we're getting there. I'll just kind of zip through those images when we get there. The next one that I wanted to show is of psilocybin species of mushrooms. Oh, OK. If this is what we have to do, it's better than nothing. But if you can get up top to the slideshow, that would be great. I think we're getting there. Great. Shipibo cloth, again, an externalization of what's happening on the inside perhaps, what's perceived on the outside, important to symbolically trans transmute it and transform it and translate it. Our, our cousin, the peyote cactus, this is the territory where many of the huicholes live in Jalisco and Nayarit in Mexico. And there's some of their artwork. Again, that's the yarn painting. <laughs> A piece of wood coated with wax. And we have here the sacred cosmology of the blue deer the blue deer is a spirit deer, and wherever the spirit deer steps grows the peyote. And so when the, when the huicholes go to what they say, hunt for their life, or walk for their life, or gain their life by doing the walk to Wirikuta, where the peyote grows, they're following the spirit deer. They're following the blue deer, and they're seeing, oh, I'm going to hunt over there. I shoot my arrow at the deer, and there it lands, and I find the peyote. Lots of other things we could say about that, but... Oh, I forgot I put our, our wonderful friend, the Bufo, on here. <laughs> Toad medicine. <clears throat> it's really a big question about who the original peoples were that worked with the toad. And one thing I think about a bit is, is the toad actually endotripping? Is the toad just tripping out all day long on its own secretions? Because it is, <laughs> it's synthesizing not only NNDMT, 5-methoxy-DMT, but also something bufotinine that we can't quite metabolize so easily, but that the toad probably does. This is a fascinating little book called Animals and Psychedelics that's documenting the complex relationship between animals and the natural world and how they seem to eat things to change their consciousness. Here we have a psilocybin mushroom, also referred to as Food of the Gods by wonderful Terence McKenna. It's a gorgeous photo. <laughs> and this is an image painted by Alex Gray in um, honor of what Terence and Dennis McKenna called the stoned ape hypothesis, which Paul Stamets, I believe, now argues is the stoned ape theory. There's a difference between an educated guess and something that perhaps can be shown to have some validation. And it was posited that it was our ancestors on the, the African savannas that were eating psilocybin mushrooms as they roamed throughout the savannas and ate their way to higher consciousness. And that, in fact, the consumption of psilocybin mushrooms actually helped us to develop language. And when we started to develop language, we gained the ability to externalize more of our internal experience and to create shared stories and memories. And eventually, from that comes our symbolic pieces of artwork, whether that's a yarn painting or a tool, whatever it is. I've been very blessed to spend some time with the Mazatec people, who are the modern day some of the modern day stewards of the sacred mushroom tradition. And I know some of you here in the crew have been there as well. <laughs> it's a special place, right? So the Mazatec people live in the state of Oaxaca, which is highlighted in green here in the southern portion of Mexico. And they live in a little town called Huautla de Jimenez with the red star up at the top. It takes about six hours by bus on a super sketchy road to get from Oaxaca City to Huautla de Jimenez. I barfed a few times, I probably cried a bit. I mean, it is quite a journey just to get there. And the reason that these people were able to keep their sacred mushroom tradition intact is because they're so isolated. If you can imagine when the conquistadores were coming through, when the Inquisition was happening, it's still hard to get there, right? In 2019, it's hard to get there on a bus, but you ain't getting up there on a donkey or on your feet. 
It took a long time for the crusade to make its way across and up into Alta de Jimenez. And so these people were able to preserve their sacred mushroom tradition. It was pretty much eradicated elsewhere throughout Mesoamerica, sadly. This is an image of Huautla in the Mazatec Sierra. I took this picture from a vantage point over by Maria Sabina's house. You can see it's situated high in the mountains. I had the pleasure of working with this teacher, Doña Julieta Casimiro. She was trained by the cousin of Maria Sabina to work with the Nino Santos. She worked with them for probably 40 plus years until she passed away last summer in her uh, mid 80s. She was one of the 13 grandmothers in the 13 Grandmothers Council. Here she is offering a water blessing, a prayer in her traditional dress, the huipil, the Mazatec huipil. And you can see on her chest, she has the Guadalupana. These people found a way to marry the traditions that were imposed upon them with the ones that they were carrying in order to survive, right? Because the medicine wanted to survive, because the people wanted to survive because the consciousness wanted to thrive. So they found a way to layer Catholicism in with their sacred mushroom tradition. So you can see on her dress, she's got mushrooms, she's got Virgin Mary. In town, there are mushrooms painted on churches. It's a really unique experience. Here I am with her in her beautiful purple living room. I happen to be a big fan of purple. And this is the gate that welcomes one to Huautla de Jimenez. As you can see, there are little mushrooms right there where it says, Bienvenido, welcome. <laughs> we also have Maria Sabina standing there at the entrance to Huautla. We also have Maria Sabina standing on top of a mushroom, of course. <laughs> so welcome to Huautla de Jimenez. <laughs> you can also take a ride in a Maria Sabina mushroom cab, should you like. <laughs> and here's a beautiful image of her from the Maria Sabina restaurant in town. I just want to invite you to take a moment and really take in her face, really take in her eyes, what it is that she might have seen, might be seeing, might still be seeing from wherever she is at this point in the game. She was a courageous woman. Here she is with a handful of mushrooms. These are photos that I took in her home which is now a museum. Here she is with an offering. A Mazatec woman who was courageous enough to share her medicine with the world, ultimately. I really love this one. Look at her eyes. So in the mid-1950s, Gordon Wasson and his wife, Valentina, were out for a hike in the woods. And they came into contact with something really interesting and novel in their relationship. They were walking along, and Valentina spotted a patch of mushrooms, and she ran to them so excited. Oh, I can't wait to gather these mushrooms and bring them home and cook them, and we're going to eat them. And Gordon Wasson was like, oh my god, those disgusting toadstools. We are absolutely not going to eat those. And thus was born an interest in this, this difference in culture of mycophobia or mycophilia fear of the mushroom or love of the mushroom. And so they set about on a quest to take a look all throughout the world and find out about different mushroom traditions, which led them eventually to Huautla de Jimenez, where they came into contact with Maria Sabina. This is Maria Sabina at her altar. And over time, over a couple years, Gordon Wasson befriended Maria Sabina and she was willing to welcome him into a mushroom velada. And as far as we know, he was one of the first quote unquote Westerners, quote unquote white people, if you will, to participate in an ancient Mazatec ceremony. <clears throat> Here she is with a handful of mushrooms, blessing them with a hand dipped candle made there in Wautla. And eventually he wrote an article that made it into Life magazine in 1957 that changed the face of the perception of mushrooms throughout the world. <laughs> seeking the magic mushroom. This brought this into mainstream consciousness. He wrote this article, talked about his experience of being be-mushroomed, and also set things on fire in the culture, right? So at this point in time, mescaline had made it into mainstream consciousness. LSD had been synthesized, but not yet 
fully gone mainstream, and now we have psilocybin mushrooms. So we see that the emergence of these technologies coming forth from the ancient Mazatec tradition, the hills, the high isolated places, the jungle of the Amazon, all coming forth. <clears throat> what happens? Gordon Wasson sends a sample of psilocybin mushrooms off to Albert Hoffman in Switzerland at Sandoz Labs. He decides to isolate psilocybin and then synthesizes it, puts it in a capsule, sends it back to Wautla de Jimenez with Gordon Wasson, who administers it to Maria Sabina, and she says, oh yeah, uh-huh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, so synthetic psilocybin, Nino Santos, same, same, but different, right? Same, same, but different. So this begs a little question about our worldview again, our paradigms. In the indigenous tradition, things are looked at more animistically. It's a more enchanted and holistic worldview. The plants, the medicines, the animals, the fungus, they're seen as teachers. In our industrialized or quote unquote Western worldview, we call these, we tend to look through a more materialistic lens. It often tends to be quite disenchanted, quite reductionist. And we look to see what's the active chemical that's present. Here in Huautla de Jimenez, the mushrooms are truly at the heart of the culture. I love this image from a gazebo in the center of town with mushrooms growing out of a heart between two children. They're also known as the great composters, right? Specifically, the saprophytic mushrooms. They break things down in nature and they break them down into the elemental particles. So what do they do inside our bodies, inside our psyches, inside our spirits? They are technology that have the opportunity to help us to break down the things that are no longer serving us. When we break these things down, we're left with elemental particles. And when you have the building blocks, the foundation to build something new, we can be more creative. So they help us to metabolize grief, suffering, pain, stress. This is Maria Sabina's grave, which we had the honor of visiting. We realized in our third mushroom ceremony in 2015 that we, it was the 60th anniversary of the night that Gordon Wasson first sat with Maria Sabina. And we thought, oh my God, we really need to memorialize this. And so we went to Maria Sabina's grave and we cleaned it and we brought flowers and we prayed and we cried and we thanked her for her sacrifice. This woman was beaten, she was hurt, her home was burned down because she was courageous enough to say, I need to share this medicine with the world. On her grave it says, Aquí reposan los restos de una mujer mazateca que con su sabiduría fue admirada por propios y extraños. Here lie the remains of a Mazatec woman with, with her healing ways, with, who with her healing ways was admired by those close and far. And we can see that on the top of her grave is a cross, but it is encompassed in a mushroom. There are mushrooms sprouting out of the bottom of it. Also right there by her grave was this little water bottle. En la vida hay dos cosas que te mueven, tus sueños y el agua. In life, there are two things that move you, your dreams and water. <laughs> really beautiful. So if you haven't had a sip of water in a while, this is a great time. <laughs> this is San Pedro tobacco. This is planted all throughout the highlands of the Mazatecas. It's a form of tobacco that is revered as a sacred guardian. It's planted at the doorways and it is used in mushroom ceremonies. It's applied to the body over any areas where we feel like there might be blockages or where there might need to be opening. This tobacco, ironically, is also St. Peter, the Catholic saint who stands at the gates of heaven. And I had a very profound healing experience at the end of my time in Oaxaca in 2015, where I went into this Catholic church in the Zocalo in town, and I was raised Catholic. And I departed the Catholic church when I was 17 years old and haven't ever gone back but I can appreciate some of the wisdom from it. And I was standing there in the church looking at St. Peter and I had this realization that, wow, it's all one. The plant is the saint, is the tobacco, is the guardian, is the opener. And it's okay, I don't have to reject this part of my lineage and my history. I can actually accept this and see that it's all one. We also have our synthetic allies, right? LSD, ketamine, MDMA. One of my teachers said, even if it comes from the chemist pot, everything comes from nature. We have two pathways forward here in the present moment that are really carving the way for psychedelics more into the mainstream and into healing. We see this through the medical and the religious paradigms. We have fantastic studies happening with MAPS, with also with Hefter, with psilocybin research. 
We, we know that psychedelics to help enhance connectivity in the brain. <clears throat> the brain becomes hyper-connected. Parts of the brain that aren't normally talking to one another start to speak with one another. We happen to draw a little correlation here between the structure of mycelium and the structure of neurons. Again, sacred technology. Our dear friend Paul Stamets proposed this nootropic psi vitamin complex at Psychedelic Science 2017, which is a, a proposed combination of psilocybin, lion's mane mushroom, and niacin, to, intended to be taken in a microdose. So we don't always need to have the macrodose heroic experience, five grams of mushrooms, 400 mics of L, five hits of ME, five MEO. We can often work with these medicines in a subtle way. They are sacred technology. We don't often need very much, just like a knife in the hands of a butcher or the hands of a serial killer can give us very different outcomes. It's how we wield the tools. It's how we wield the technology. So where do we go from here? What does the medicine actually want? I think that we're really poised at a very important time. Many of you probably know that the Amazon is currently burning at a rate of one and a half football fields per minute. The lungs of the planet are being destroyed so that we can raise more cattle and ship that meat around the world to feed human beings. Whether you choose to eat meat or not, that's your preference, but perhaps we should think about the impact on the whole biosphere when we are so anthropocentrically focused on our own needs. We may end up with things looking like this. Almost done. I'd like to end with just a few more slides. A quote from Albert Hoffman on his 100th birthday, he was known to be microdosing until he passed away at 102. He said, LSD wanted to tell me something. It gave me an inner joy, an openness, an open-mindedness, a gratefulness, open eyes, and an internal sensitivity for the miracles of creation. I put a piece of that quote on my business card, which is hopefully making its way around to you. Alex Gray at Psychedelic Science 2013 talked about his painting of Albert Hoffman and described this angel up there on the left-hand corner as the alchemical angel of LSD crying tears of compassion for humanity into the LSD molecule, which was being developed at the same time as the atomic bomb on the other side of the world, the technology to both destroy the world or save the world. How do we move forward? Permaculture, a fantastic way of orienting towards life-sustaining systems for all beings. We have the opportunity to work with things like the eyes, intention, intuition, intelligence, integrity, inspiration, information, involving ourselves and integrating our experiences. We have the tools, we have the time, the time is now. Check out our website, eerievision.org, where we talk about integration guidelines, ways to bring these experiences into your life that have meaning and benefit. I'm also on the board of Limina Foundation and the Center for Psychedelic Therapies and Research where I teach about holistic medicine. If you'd like to participate in our fantastic psychedelic survey, go on to liminafoundation.com and it'll be open for about another week, then we're gonna tally it up. <laughs> Last thing I'll leave you with is a question that I've used to guide myself over the past year specifically, which has been a hard year, I must say. What would love do when you are faced with a very difficult time, a really challenging situation, if you can just still yourself for a moment, sit down, breathe, and ask yourself, what would love do? What would love do? Love would be compassionate, love would be kind. Love also might look like Kali with her fierce slicing of your head. <laughs> there are times for setting boundaries, there are times for saying no, and there are times for saying, I surrender. What would love do? I'm going to choose love. Love is the answer. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Natalie Metz, everyone. Give it up.